of our lives and of everything we are and everything we say and everything we do, why don't we put him first? If we say he's our hope, if we say he's our savior, our Lord, why is he not first? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.
going to sing a song that is just so precious to me. It's called It Is Well With My Soul. It says that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what this world throws at you, that if you have your eyes on God and your faith in God, that you can always say that it is well because our God is bigger than anything this world can throw at us. So let's stand together right now as we sing It Is Well With My Soul.
Let's pray together. And as we go to the Lord in prayer, let me just remind you that when we come together in meetings like this, we have multiple opportunities in the different elements of our worship service to do exactly that, which is to worship. And so, Father, as we come to this time that we have set aside to worship through our gifts, our return on your investment in us, we are cognizant of the fact that all of our lives are gifts from you. And so we come to you to worship you as Almighty God. As the choir has reminded us, the, the appropriate thing for us to do is to stand in awe of you and fall before you in worship. You are God. You are our God, not because of our own goodness or good doing, but because you have made that possible. And we respond to that appropriately the giving of ourselves and our talents and our time, but also of our, fun, uh, of our money. And this funding that you have blessed us with, we return to you so that you might be honored and glorified through the way we do church in this community and in the world at large. Use this for your glory as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
that luncheon is today, as soon as this service is over. It's Taco Tuesday on Sunday. Dr. Nichols will tell you more about that in a little bit. I hope that you'll plan on sticking around and having lunch. Um, so, one of, the, one of the problems that pastors and preachers have these days is uh, verifying the truthfulness of stories. And I want to tell you one as we begin today that I know must be true because I found it on the internet, so it, it has to be <laughs> valid. It is told as true, and so whether or not it could be adequately documented might be up for grabs, but uh, I do at least want to get the story across to you. It is said of Ulysses S. Grant, uh, somewhere in the latter part of his life, he made a trip over to Scotland, and while he was in Scotland, he was invited to go out and watch this new game, or at least it was new to him, the game of golf. And so he went out with the people that were handling him, and uh, they positioned him in such a way they explained the rules to him. And, and so this one guy said, let, let me demonstrate for you. And to those of you who are golfers out there, you'll find yourself in this story, I suspect, because the guy that was going to show him how golf went teed up a ball, and he stepped back, and he, had, you know, he looked at the ball, and he got all situated just right, and he stepped back and took a practice swing, and he thought that was sufficient, and so he stepped up to address the ball. And he pulled back in his backswing, and as he came around with a mighty swing, he missed the ball totally and dug out a big trench of grass. That sounds like the guys you play with, doesn't it? And uh, Ulysses Grant didn't say anything about that. He just kind of took it all in, and of course the guy swinging the club was pretty embarrassed about that. And so he took, took another step back, and he took a practice swing, and it felt right that time. So he came up, addressed the ball again, took a mighty swing. Same thing as before, took, took out a big old chunk of grass. And oh, he's embarrassed by this time, so he took another mighty heave at it. Same result. After about a half a dozen of those, Ulysses Grant is said to have looked at him and said, well, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in this game, but I don't really understand the purpose of the ball. So here's what we learn from that. Failure to embrace one's purpose diminishes that person's life experience. If you don't get the purpose right, then you spend the rest of your life chasing things that don't seem to fit or to fulfill, better said. I was on the phone with a friend of mine this week. I love it when the Lord drops great sermon illustrations in my lap, and uh, that happened this week. I already had the sermon pretty well laid out, and I was on the phone with a friend of mine. He's from Oklahoma, and he was talking about a gathering that they had in his church or some of the people of his church, and they had a guest speaker came in, come in who is actually a writer, and uh, he was a cowboy, like a cowboy's cowboy, but he was a writer, and he was speaking to this group of Christian people and uh, he, he held up a baseball glove. The guy also was a would-be uh, baseball player. And so he held up a baseball glove, and he asked this question, what is the purpose of this glove? Now, if I were to ask this crowd today that question, and you felt comfortable enough in a church setting to answer me, I suspect that most of, this is dangerous for me to fill in words for you, but I suspect that most of us, if I held up a baseball glove and said, what is the purpose of this glove? Our answers, most of us would be to catch a ball. Is that fair? You're with me. Okay, so that's what they answered because it's the obvious answer. But he, so he threw it down on the floor opposite of where he was standing there. He reached under the pulpit or the lectern and, and he grabbed a baseball and he tossed that baseball over to where that glove lay on the ground, and he threw it perfectly. It hit a square on the glove and bounced off and rolled away. To which he then replied, if the purpose, the sole purpose of that glove is to catch a baseball, we just demonstrated that it is a miserable failure. I want us to wear that a little bit today, or a lot today, because the reality is that most of us have directed our lives into a certain 
uh, area or arena, a certain set of endeavors that whether we call it that or not, we believe somehow is going to give us that purpose fulfillment that brings fulfillment for our lives. In other words, whether we call it what we really mean or not, most of us set our sights on accomplishing something. This is what my life is going to be about. We do that as parents with our young children. And when those young children are still at home driving you nuts, you have to have a reason for sticking it out with them. And so part of our purpose, we says, well, we need to raise these children to be what they're supposed to be. Well, that might fit. Some of us set our purpose in life as towards, uh, well, I, I want to be successful. My, my purpose, and, and we get it mixed up with our goals, but my purpose is that I might bank a million dollars by the time I'm 30. We, we have all kinds of different ways. We set our purpose towards different things, or maybe we don't set them at all, and we just kind of muddle along through life without any real sense of direction and trying to accomplish what we're supposed to be about. Jesus understood that. Jesus understood the value of us knowing what our purpose is. And so in this passage, not only the passage we're going to look at today, but actually this new series where we're going to be looking in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 as we study the Sermon on the Mount together, this will take us a while to get through it. The, the series we'll look at as we begin today, we'll look at this idea of fulfilling our purpose in life. But before we can fulfill it, we have to make sure that we know what it is. So in Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to start today. And actually, I'm not starting at the beginning of Jesus' sermon. Uh, that's the Beatitudes. We'll be looking at the Beatitudes in our Sunday night Bible studies starting next week. And I'll probably preach a sermon on the, the full total of those Beatitudes next week. But uh, we'll tear them apart one by one in our Sunday night studies because they're just full of meaning for us and how we go through life as followers of Jesus Christ. But I want to start on the back side of those today in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Now, I, I, let me just say this. I've had a couple of people uh, highlight this for me, so let me help you understand. I tend to uh, read and preach from the English Standard Version, ESV. Uh, sometimes I will go to the NIV with you, but most of the time it's the English Standard Version. There's a lot of reasons that I do that, and I'll be happy to share those with you if you want to talk to me about it. But in the English Standard Version, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, Jesus begins to address this idea of our purpose. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, here's purpose statement, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus wades into this whole purpose thing in these first couple of verses. So what I want you to get first is that our purpose can be summed up in this basic statement. We are responsible for reflecting Jesus to the world. Jesus comes at this with two different metaphors. And I'm not going to exhaust these today, but I want to hit a few things about them that will help us settle into it a little bit. First of all, he talks about being salt. Now, as we come into this, this is verse 13. As we come into this discussion about being salt of the earth, uh, let, me, let me throw this statement out at you, and you can just kind of hang on to it. Um, the problem with the obvious for most of us is that it's just too obvious. 
In other words, there are obvious truths in our life that if we're not really paying attention to, we lose those truths and we just go right past them. For instance, um, now we've been in El Paso now for what, six weeks or so, Teresa and I have been. And uh, I, I want to say to you all, thank you for the gift cards that you gave us when you gave us a pounding. Those are incredible. And what it's helped me to do is helped me to understand by personal experience restaurant life in El Paso. <laughs> awesome. What a great way to learn a city. I, I find something across the board to be true in El Paso, just like it's been true everywhere else that I've lived. As far as I know, all of my life I've seen this, except at my house. But here's what I find. The problem with the obvious is it's sometimes just so obvious. You know what I find to be common on every table of every restaurant that I've eaten at in El Paso? Salt shakers. Now, there's pepper shakers there also, but that's not in this text, so let me just talk about the salt part of it. <laughs> The problem with the obvious is it's just too obvious. Why, why do restaurant owners put salt shakers on their tables? Because unless I'm missing something, if you're a restaurant owner, first of all, I need to get to know you. I eat every day. Um, so if you're a restaurant owner, I don't, I don't want you to take this too you know, personally at all, actually. It's just kind of a point I want to make. But... Is it not advertising when, when a restaurant puts salt on their table? Are they not advertising? Our food might not be tasty enough for you, so here's some salt to make it better. Now, we don't think about it that way, do we? But every restaurant that I know anything about puts a salt shaker on the table because some people just want that little added zing when it comes to taste. Why does Jesus say to his followers, you are the salt of the earth. What does he mean by that? You know, in first century Greco-Roman world, first century Palestine, Jesus and his disciples are on a hillside up on the north uh, end of the Sea of Galilee. They're gathered in a kind of a natural amphitheater there. Um, when he says these words to them, they would have heard you are the salt of the earth in the context of their lives that day. You know that Jesus could have been referring to up to 11 different uh, kinds of truths with this. Salt in that society was used in a lot of different ways. One of them, this is kind of one of those that made me go, wow. Uh, one of the ways they often used salt in the first century was to pay Roman soldiers. If they didn't have money to pay them, they would use salt to do it. That's, by the way, probably one of the places we get that term we, when we say somebody's not worth their salt. Uh, may come from that use. It was a commodity that they traded in as, as pay, even. It may be that Jesus is just talking, like I just got through talking about, as a seasoning agent. It makes things taste a little bit better. Uh, clearly, they use salt as a preservative as they were transferring fish, especially from the Sea of Galilee to nearby towns, they had to preserve them some way. There are up to 11 different ways that Jesus could have been using this term and wanted his disciples to pick it up. But here, let's, let's just put it this way. We'll boil it down and take all of them total. Here's what I think Jesus is saying with this. His followers need to season. They need to make an impact. They need to have some kind of influence on the society in which they lived. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus goes on in verse 13 to say that a saltless salt is useless in society. In other words, only Christ's followers can pull off what he's talking about here. There, there's something about our purpose that causes him to call us salt. He doesn't say you should be salt. He doesn't say you should be good salt. He doesn't even say, you know, it's possible you could be salt. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Those are big words for us, and they tend to be bigger than what we often want them to be. And maybe we should stop for a second and ask this question about our Christianity in these days, because sociologists and ecclesiologists tell us that we live in a time that American society is referred to as a post Christian society. 
In other words, we've lost our voice. We're saltless, some would say. We probably should stop and ask why that is. We're, not, we're clearly not the ones who came up with that term. Somebody else is saying that our society is beyond the Christian influence of that. What happened with us? A lot of reasons. That's a complex answer, I think. But let me just take you back to one of those old middle school boy um, tricks that we used to play on people. And maybe there's some application for us. Remember the old deal in the junior high lunchroom where we would take salt shakers that they had and unscrew the top of them? Some of you do. Some of you. I took you back. It was a great memory, wasn't it? In case you're not familiar with that, uh, some people, I'm not saying I would ever do that, but some people would take those salt shakers, unscrew the metal lids just enough so that it was kind of sitting on there. Uh, you couldn't really tell it just by looking at it, but the hope was that the next guy would come pick up that salt shaker and go to salt his food and the top come off and just salt goes everywhere all over his plate. Happened a lot. Never once did I see anybody eat that plate of food after salt did that to it. You know why? Because too much salt is not good. Now be careful how you hear what I just said. Is it possible for our society to get too much Christianity? And my answer to that would be, what kind of Christianity are you talking about? Jesus was the most appealing people drawing person of his time people couldn't get enough of him but it may be that we live in a post-christian society because somewhere down the line we adopted an approach to christianity which was to be against stuff more than we were for jesus I grew up in Baptist churches, evangelical churches all of my life, and we used to have this saying. I, I, I heard it from my dad a lot, not because he believed it, but because he was highlighting something about our world in which we live. And many times I would hear these kind of statements. We are followers of Jesus, and we don't drink, and we don't dance. This is how I know this was a long time ago. We, we don't dip snuff. And... We don't date girls who do. <laughs> Surely, as Christians, we're more than just being against stuff. A lot of Christians in our day are known for what they're against. That's okay. I'm not saying we shouldn't take stands that are ethical and moral and all that. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that that's not salt. That's just taking a stand on something. There's got to be more to this. Jesus says, you are salt of the earth. Jesus is appealing. He was then. He is now. And our purpose is to point people to him. You're the salt of the earth. We'll go to the next one. He says, you're the light of the world. This is verses 14 through 16. Let, let me take you back to just maybe a great point of reference for you to help highlight what he's saying with this, I think. Um, since we met last, uh, I have been to Odessa and back twice. And uh, as I told you last week when our service was over, we loaded up and I took uh, our, my wife. Her mother was diagnosed with uh, cancer a couple of weeks ago, breast cancer. And so Wednesday of this week, she had surgery and she recovered fine. But Teresa spent the week there with her. And so I took her Sunday evening and had a chance to visit with my mother-in-law a little bit before I came home Sunday night. Uh, and then I went back Friday, picked Teresa up and brought her back last night. So two different times on my way back into El Paso this week, I was struck with the reality of this passage. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So here's, here's, in case you haven't driven into El Paso from Odessa, from that region recently at night, let me tell you, there's not much to see. Most of the time, there's just not much to see. So driving it at night is not a bad thing. But I saw this last Sunday night, and so I paid more attention to it last night as we drove in after dark. And, and about the time you get past uh, Sierra Blanca and the check mark out, uh, checkpoint out there, uh, the road kind of bends back up coming this direction. And as I made that bend, I started paying attention to what was off to the left. You know what's off to the left of the highway there? Nothing. There's just nothing. 
But the closer I got to El Paso, the more I started seeing these, uh, these groupings of light. And first it was, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 orange colored lights that were out there and nothing else. And another 10 or 15 miles up the road, I looked off to the left and, and I started seeing some more. And you get up closer to where Fort Hancock is and, you know, you see lights. And before you know it, you get to the point where there's this just broad sweep of lights ahead of you of all the different communities that make up the greater El Paso area. And so on the way in last night, I, th I decided I want to see how far out you can see the lone star that's on the side of the mountain out here. Have you ever done that? Here's where I saw it for the first time, right about the cutoff for Fabens. Well, I think it's Fabens. I know that it's the steakhouse on the other side because I've been in El Paso a while. That's a long ways out there when I first could make out distinctly the lone star that's on the side of the mountain here. That's dozens of miles from here. And my mind went to this verse. You're the light of the world. A city, let me, let me modernize that. A star set on a hill cannot be hidden. What does Jesus mean by that? One of the things that that star and the picture of all of those lights reminds us is that light penetrates the darkness. I, I use the term for this series, brilliant. The term means to be shining, to be bright. It, it is that that penetrates through the darkness, and it is no mistake that Jesus, it's no accident that Jesus says of us, you are the light of the world. We live in a post-Christian society in America. That's no different than living in a godless world that we have always lived in, and Jesus came into that world as the light of the world, and we are, our purpose is to reflect him into the darkness. If we want fulfillment in our lives, we must do that, and we must do that well. Not every Christian gets that right. Even some of us who may be getting it right now have not always gotten it right. There was a time in my life, God has an incredible sense of humor, because there was a time in my life when people would identify, identify me and say, your, your dad's a pastor, right? My standard reply was, look, just because he's a pastor doesn't mean that I am. And I'm sure God today goes, yeah, go ahead, say something else. We, we can try to live like we're not the light of the world. We can intentionally try to soften the light penetration. Jesus says that's counterintuitive to who you are. Look again. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all of the house. And then the purpose statement that just resonates across the whole passage, it, taught, it ties the salt and the light statements together. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That is our purpose, and that is the point to which we must live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. It is to influence it is to reflect who Jesus Christ is. But in order for us to do that, we're going to have to stop embracing our own agenda. And we're going to have to embrace His. One last thing I'll say here before we go. Jesus gets um, very serious with the religious leaders of His day. Because we can hear all of that. If you put yourself into that group of people on the side of that mountain that day, you can hear all of this stuff and go, that's right, Jesus, get after it, man. That's who we are. We all love to have good purpose in life. We all love to be working towards some good end. And we could all go, yeah, Jesus, get after it. Then Jesus takes on this tone. It's going to be more than just a tone. It's going to be an outright assault before it's all said and done. And he hints at that in verse 20. And then the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to find that there are these contrasting statements. You've heard that it was said before, but I say to you this, and Jesus takes on the professional religionists of his day. 
the scribes and the Pharisees. So we get to verse 24. I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If you're in that crowd on that hillside in the first century, that would have just, just baffled you. You mean to tell me, Jesus, that you're saying that unless my righteousness goes beyond these professional religion people, that I can't even get into the kingdom of heaven? That didn't make sense in the first century. So Jesus is going to spend the rest of the sermon helping it to make sense. And here's, I'm going to pull it all down. We'll get to all that sooner or later. But here's essentially what he says. If your emphasis in being what Jesus wants you to be is just doing the right things and not doing the wrong things, if it's an external religion and there's no internal heart to it, then you're not going to make the great. Because that's the religion of the scribes and Pharisees. Oh, they did all the right things, and they didn't do any of the wrong things, and they, they were careful enough not to do the wrong things that they didn't do some things that probably were okay. And Jesus steps into that mix, and he says, that's not good enough. So what is good enough? It comes down to this purpose we have, that we would live in such a way that people would see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. I love the story of the little girl. And I've seen this in a number of different ways, so I'm not really sure what the original story was, but it's been told enough that it's taken on a life of its own. The story of the little girl who sits down at her uh, table in their living room, and she takes a piece of paper and a pencil, and she's just scribbling. I mean, she's just all over the paper, and her mama sees what's going on and says, what are you doing there? And the little girl doesn't even look up. She says, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the mom is taken back by that, especially given the nature of the drawing. And so she gets around behind, she looks over her shoulder, and she says, you, you, what are you doing? She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And, she, and the mom says, well, you know, honey, um, nobody's ever seen God. And, the little, and, and so because of that, we don't really know what God looks like. And the little girl didn't look up. She just fired right back. They will when I'm finished with this picture. <laughs> and you know what? God has strategically placed you into a circle of people who desperately need life. I'll say that again. I've said it many times already. I hope you're starting to memorize it. God has strategically placed you in a circle of people who desperately need life. You see the faces of those people while we're sitting here today in your mind's eye? Those people who don't know Jesus Christ, those people who are living at the mercy of life circumstances and it's eating their lunch who are the people in your circle? You are the picture of God for them. Don't think that means that you have to be perfect because you can't be. But you reflect back in. You're the light. You're the city on a hill. You're the salt. You're the one who brings life into the picture because you reflect who God is for them. That's your purpose in life. And those people that God has sprinkled into your life through the years are the ones who need that life. And so they don't need to see you being a good ethical person. That's great. You should be. But they need to see Jesus alive and at work in your life. That's what they need. And that's our purpose. And it's a brilliant strategy that God has put together. But it only works when the brilliance of his love and his life are reflected off of our hearts into the hearts of other people. Let's pray. And as we come to this, Father, we ask you to help us to get our purpose right. For those who are here today who don't know Jesus Christ at all, I pray that you would move in their hearts even now to respond to the offer of life that he gives. We pray that this would be a time when you would become very real to all of us, that you would help us to embrace the purpose that is given before us and that we will deny ourselves and our agenda and we will allow you to work through us and in us so that we might be the star on the side of the mountain that everybody around can see and it's not us, but it's you to whom we point. Change lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. Time of invitation. God's dealing with you about anything, and you don't even know what that's about. Now's a good time.
We'll be down front. You come. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel.